Well, thank you everybody for joining us for our webinar. So today we're going to be having a bit of a think about returning to the UK and not falling victim to HM revenue. And we're going to learn some of those really key tax, tax considerations for a move to the UK. So in, to introduce myself, my name is Peter Webb. I'm head of tax advisory for the Fry Group. And before we really get going, there are just a couple of housekeeping points before we get started. The first is, please do use the Q&A button to ask any questions as we go through. I'm going to try and answer as many of your questions as I can at the end of the presentation. Um, secondly, we'll be happy to forward on a copy of today's slides and I'll include our contact details to allow you to do that on our last slide. So you have the opportunity to ask me many questions as we go through using that Q&A box. But I'm gonna have a couple of questions for you as we go through as well. And the first of those questions is gonna be popping up on your screen now. So uh, the question I'm actually asking is, has the pandemic affected your plans to return to the UK? And you've got a couple of options there. Uh, so yes, it has accelerated, changed plans, no plans remain the same. I'll give you a few seconds to vote on that one and pop your answer into the question. I can see lots and lots of you are voting. Just give you a couple more seconds. Okay, I think the voting's slowing down now, so perhaps we'll close the poll at that point and see how we did. Oh, goodness me, 44% of you say it has accelerated or changed your plans. So almost half of you, but 56% no plans remain the same. Okay, so on this slide, you'll see our agenda for today. Um, just a couple of points about this. I am, I'm only talking about UK tax. So please do have regard to any other tax implications that may arise anywhere else for you. And the other thing to say is that I think really the global pandemic has created significant changes to all of our lives. I think many expatriates are facing an unexpected return to the UK for career or personal reasons. We saw maybe 44% of you this is actually affecting you. And from my side, I'm spending most of my time at the moment talking to expats who are moving to the UK. I think one of the most common scenarios I see is that we have a family and we have one spouse who is moving to the UK, perhaps with children, to get them into school, perhaps for the autumn term. But you have a spouse who's earning significantly is going to remain in an overseas location for longer. And that can cause some real challenges on the tax front. And there's some good advice to give around that particular scenario. And you'll see that as we go through the presentation. All right, so what do you need to consider before your return to the UK? There are an awful lot of ducks that you need to line up in a very neat row before your move back. So I think one of the most important consideration, when will you come back to the UK? Uh, that can be very, very significant on the tax front. Will my family be returning to the UK ahead of me? And you'll see as we dig into this a little bit, that, that actually can cause some significant tax changes for you. Uh, the timing of when accommodation becomes available is very significant too. You need to consider the cost of living. Um, and also, how long are you gonna be in the UK? Is there an opportunity for you to move overseas again? Or is it a permanent move to the UK? And different scenarios need different advice and a different plan. I think really significantly, what we need to focus on is are there actions that you can take while you remain non-UK tax resident that will reduce your tax bill after you've returned to the UK. And that's the crux 
of the advice that we're talking through today. So why do you care about becoming a UK tax resident? Why does that matter? Well, your UK tax residence status determines how much tax you pay in the UK. If you're not UK tax resident and you've been non-resident for more than five years, generally you're only charged to UK tax on UK sources of income. And you're only charged to capital gains tax in the UK on the disposal of UK land and property. So as that long-term non-UK tax resident, any other income and gains that are accruing for you, they're not charged to UK tax. After you've become UK tax resident, that changes fundamentally for you. So if you're UK tax resident, and you're also what we call a UK domiciled person, we'll dig into that too. Um, you are fully liable to UK tax on your worldwide income and your worldwide capital gains as they arise from the date that you become UK tax resident and going forward from there. So your UK resident status is incredibly important and your precious non-UK tax resident status, which is reducing your exposure to UK tax, should be preserved for as long as you can possibly manage that. Just pause there for a second. Now, if you've been non-UK resident for less than five years and you're returning to the UK, then you really do need to take some specialist advice as there are some very tricky rules to be aware of. And we're going to cover those in brief in a couple of slides. But for a short term non-UK tax resident, the position can be slightly different to what I've just described here. So I did give a brief mention to what we call your domicile status. As well as a, a tax resident status, you have another tax status in the eyes of the UK. And that other tax status is equally important. And we call this your domicile status. Your UK tax resident status is assessed each year under the, the complicated statutory residence test. But your domicile status is assessed maybe over your lifetime. Everybody has a domicile status at every point in their lives. And generally, you acquire a domicile status from your father's domicile status. We call that a domicile of origin. It's very hard to shake off. As a very general comment, matters can be far more complicated than that. Now, why your domicile status matters, why do we care about this? If you're UK domiciled, your worldwide estate, all assets that you own everywhere are potentially within the charge of UK inheritance tax. And that UK inheritance tax liability can be as high as 40% on everything above 325,000 pounds. That could be the biggest UK tax exposure that you have. If you are not UK domiciled, then your exposure to UK inheritance tax is limited. It's limited to UK assets only. Your overseas assets are not within the charge to UK inheritance tax, and that can be a, a really big advantage for a non-UK domicile. Also, for a UK domicile, when you're resident in the UK, worldwide income and gains are simply taxed in the UK as they arise. For a non-UK domicile, when you're resident in the UK, for a time at least, you're able to exclude overseas income and gains from UK tax, this can be advantageous too. So there's a lot of advice to give around that exclusion of overseas income and gains from UK tax for somebody who is not domiciled but is resident in the UK. There are many conditions that need to be complied with to make that work for you. So for a non-UK domicile, who becomes UK tax resident, 
that really helpful, that really advantageous non-UK domicile definitely has a shelf life. So at, at the absolute outer limit, that non-UK domicile status is going to prevail for 15 out of 20 years of UK tax residence. But if you've settled in the UK uh, and it is really clear that the UK is now your permanent home, that really helpful non-UK domicile status can evaporate far more quickly. Okay, so we've been exploring the differences between being non-UK tax resident and UK tax resident. So what we're gonna do now is focus a little bit on that really tricky transition between those two tax resident statuses. So I think the first thing to say is, how do you know if you're a UK tax resident? So from 2013, we do have what we call the statutory residence test. And this is a piece of legislation which is used to determine your UK tax resident status. Uh, it's a three part test. There are three steps to it. The first question you ask is, have you met the conditions for automatic non-residence? And if you can say that, you're done, you're not resident. But if you can't answer that yes, if, if you can't meet the conditions for automatic non-residence, you then have to proceed to step two. Step two asks the question, well, if you're not automatically non-resident, are you automatically UK resident? And if you meet the tests for automatically UK tax residency, then you're done, you're UK tax resident for the year. But what about if you don't meet the conditions for automatic non-residence, then you've moved on to step two, but you don't meet those conditions for automatic tax residence either. What happens then? At that point, you fall into the third and final part of the statutory residence test, and we call this the sufficient ties test. Now, under that sufficient ties test, you look at your connections with the UK, and depending on the number of connections you have, will then allow you the number of nights in the UK that you can spend without becoming UK tax resident. The fewer connections you have, the more time you can spend in the UK, the more connections you have, the less time that you can spend in the UK. So when it comes to understanding how much time you can spend in the UK without becoming UK tax resident, it's quite a compli complicated uh, scenario to wor work through with you. And you'll see on this slide, I've summarized this. There are circumstances where you can be UK tax resident with as few as 16 nights in the UK, one six. But there are other circumstances where you could be UK non-resident with as many as 182 nights in the UK. It's really important to understand what your limit is for maintaining that non-UK tax resident status. So I, I like the statutory residence test in one way because it gives you certainty. It sets everything out for you. You work it through and you come to a definite conclusion. What I don't like about it is its complexity. And I, I think there are some traps in there for, for the unwary or, or the unadvised as well. When we think about that tricky transition between the non-tax resident status to the tax resident status, I think one of the most complex areas, areas is a thing called split year treatment. Now, when we work through that statutory residence test, you come up with an answer that either you're non-tax resident for the year or your tax resident for the year. So under the, the statutory residence test, if you're tax resident for the year, you're tax resident from the 6th of April through to the following 5th of April. So if you're tax resident in this tax year, you would be tax resident from 6th of April 21 to 5th of April 2022. 
And if you're UK domiciled, what that would mean is that in this tax year, your worldwide income and gains, including all your overseas earnings, would be subject to UK tax in full. Well, that's going to be a bit of a disaster if you're tax resident for the year, but actually you only came back to the UK in October and you've had maybe six months of really um, maybe income in Dubai, which hasn't been taxed at all, which is then suddenly charged to UK tax. So what stops that happening? What stops that happening is a really helpful thing called split year treatment. And what split year treatment does, it prevents you from becoming UK tax resident from the default date of the 6th of April at the beginning of the tax year. It allows you to maintain that UK non-tax resident status until a date later in the tax year. Split year treatment is particularly tricky. You need to understand how, how you can make this work for you. When you return from overseas, there are five different cases of this special split year treatment that, that could apply to you. I think it's probably easiest to illustrate this with some real life illustrations to, to see how this works in practice. Um, I've, I've got a couple of illustrations I'm going to talk you through. Uh, what I would say is that I've, I've, I've changed the names in these illustrations to protect the innocent here. So, Duncan. Duncan was living and working in Singapore for many, many years, and he returned to the UK in 2018. He returned to the UK in November 2018, and between 6th of April and November, he hadn't visited the UK at all. He'd remained in Singapore and was earning really well in Singapore. Now, Duncan's wife and children actually went back to the UK in June 2018 to make sure that the children were ready for school in September. Now, what happened to Duncan was that Duncan became UK tax resident and fully taxable on his worldwide income and gains from June 2018 when his wife and children started to have a home in the UK. And he had to pay UK tax at rates as high as 40%, 45% of your pardon, on his Singapore earnings from June until November. What had happened with Duncan is that he had triggered UK tax residents by starting to have a home in the UK. And that was months before his physical return to the UK. OK, another story to tell you, another war story. So this was um, Giles, again, name changed. Now, Giles returned to the UK in December 2017 after many years working in Dubai. Um, now, with Giles, his wife and children had continued to live in the UK throughout his time working overseas. Now, in Dubai, his rental agreement on his apartment expired at the end of August 2017. And rather than um, renew it for 12 months and pay that 12 months rental up front in Dubai, he decided that he would just um, let that lapse and he would moved into a serviced apartment, funny enough, at the, the Fairmont Hotel on the Sheikh Zayed Road, if you know that in Dubai. So he moved into this serviced apartment from August until December when he actually moved back to the UK. Now, what happened with Giles is that he became UK tax resident when he started to have his only home in the UK. And that happened when he gave up his rental apartment in Dubai. Because moving into that service department, that service department couldn't be seen as a home it didn't have the degree of permanence and stability that would indicate it was a home for him. So he fell into one of these traps in the, the statutory residence test on, on the split year treatment. I think that the takeaway from those two stories is that care is needed, advice is essential, and it's entirely possible 
to become UK tax resident even months before you physically return to the UK. Um, when we advise clients, uh, sometimes if we have the situation, which I'm seeing uh, a lot at the moment, where you have perhaps one spouse going back to the UK, um, children going back to the UK to get them into the schools for, for September, is that for that trailing spouse who, who's going to remain overseas for longer, uh, to help them avoid these split year treatment traps, a lot of the advice we give is around, well, how can you maintain that UK non-tax resident status through to the end of the tax year in which your family have returned? That, that's one of the strategies that's certainly worth exploring for you. Now, there are some special rules that kick in if you've been away from the UK for less than five years. And we call these the, the temporary non-residence rules. And under these temporary non-residence rules, you can be charged to tax on certain income and gains you received or even remitted to the UK in a period of temporary non-residence. Uh, very briefly, you're a temporary non-resident if you were resident in the UK for four out of seven years before you left the UK and your time overseas, your time of non-residence was less than five years. Now, if that's you, what can happen is you can receive tax charges in the UK in the tax year that you return and become resident again. Where we see this most commonly is around capital gains tax. So you might go overseas um, and while you're overseas, perhaps you sell some shares at a gain. You've done that in a complete year of non-UK tax residence. But if you're outside of the UK for less than five years and you own those shares before you left the UK, then the capital gains tax on those shares is charged to you in the year of your return. So if you're outside of the UK for less than five years, it's really important to understand are you caught by these rules? And if so, what assets are within the scope of that possible tax charge if you do return to the UK within five years? As I say, mainly we see this for capital gains tax, but there are other bits and pieces that these temporary non-residence rules can catch. Uh, there are some pension lump sums, for example, um, income received under the, the complex disguised remuneration rules. Um, uh, as a UK tax resident, perhaps in the past, they can be caught for that too. Um, I think chargeable event gains on perhaps some kind of insurance bond that, that's an investment for you, those kinds of chargeable event gains can be caught for these temporary non-residence rules as well. I think the takeaway from this slide is that if, if you're outside of the UK, if you're non-resident, less than five years and you're coming back to the UK, then it's really important to take advice to see if you are caught for these rules. So we've trailed this a little bit earlier on when we talked about being UK tax resident, but not UK domicile. So we went through the advantages of being a non-UK domicile inheritance tax, big advantage only UK assets are within the charge. And when you're UK tax resident as a non-domicile, you have the opportunity to exclude what we call unremitted overseas income and gains from UK tax, provided that various complex uh, conditions are complied with. So you've come back to the UK, you're not UK domiciled, you've been careful with the split year treatment so you know uh, when when you're within the scope of UK tax on your worldwide income and gains. So you know when you need to think about these rules. So in order for a non-UK domicile to be able to benefit from a special basis of taxation, which means that overseas income and gains arising outside of the UK can be excluded from UK tax, just run through the, some of these conditions. Um, so the overseas income and gains that you're not taxing in the UK, they need to stay outside of the UK. If you need all of your income and gains in the UK, this special basis of taxation is not going to work for you. 
It works well if you have a limited time in the UK um, or if you're perhaps funding a life outside of the UK and you know that you can actually use those overseas income and gains um, outside of the UK. There are some downsides to using this special remittance basis of taxation, which is very briefly, you can lose entitlement to personal tax allowances. So £12,570 is, is the tax allowance this year. And once you've been UK tax resident for seven out of nine years, if you want to continue to enjoy using this special basis of taxation, you have to pay an annual charge and it's eye-watering, it's £30,000 a year. Once you've been resident for 12 out of 14 years, that's £60,000 a year. So it's unlikely to be beneficial in the longer term, but in the shorter term, it might work for you. What I would say that as a, a UK resident, non-UK domicile, you always have the choice between using the special remittance basis of taxation or just being taxed on your worldwide income and gains as they arise. So it's always a good idea to take some specialist advice, and this is specialist advice, to understand whether this is going to be beneficial for you, whether you can make it work. And just to briefly mention, we'll, we'll come on to it in a, a little bit, is inheritance tax. I've mentioned it a couple of times very briefly. There is a very big advantage for inheritance tax for a, a non-UK domicile. Okay, preparing for your return. So we've talked an awful lot about that transition back to the UK. What we're gonna focus on now for the next part of our presentation is some of those, what I would call pre-return actions that we would suggest to you to make sure you're ready for life in the UK, at least on the UK tax front. So at this point, we're gonna pause and we're gonna ask you another question. And the question will be popping up on your screens quite shortly. And the question I'm asking you is, when are you going to return to the UK? Or when are you gonna to move to the UK? And you have your options coming up there. So within six months, within 12 months, or more than 12 months. I can see lots and lots of you are voting on that one. Um, just give you a couple more seconds. Okay, I think the voting's slowing down a bit now, so I think we'll close the poll in there and just see how you answered that one. Okay, so this is a bit, we ran this same webinar a, a little bit earlier today, and you've come up with a very, very different result, actually. So 13% of you are going to be returning to the UK within the next six months. So really quite shortly, a uh, further 16% are going to return within 12 months. So that's about 30% of you who are going to return to the UK within the next year. But for the other 70% of you, it's going to be a longer time frame. So perhaps more than 12 months down the line. Thank you for that. Okay. When we think about planning your return to the UK, one of the really important aspects is to understand what this is going to mean for your employment income and are there actions that you need to take. Um, I think that the top of the list here is termination payments, because these are really, really tricky. If you are UK tax resident at any time, at any point in a tax year, when you receive a termination payment or become entitled to a termination payment, that termination payment could be charged to UK tax in full, even though you may have been non-UK tax resident throughout your time overseas. So whether you're going to receive a termination payment is really important to understand what the UK tax implications are. You, you basically have two choices. Um, my advice, if you're able to manage it, is to stay non-UK tax resident for the entire tax year in which you become entitled to such a termination payment or that termination payment ideally is paid out to you in that year. 
I realize that real life isn't like that and that may not be possible. So what you would then rely on is remaining non-UK tax resident, but also tax resident in a jurisdiction with a favorable double taxation agreement, which may give you protection from UK tax on that termination payment, and then rely on split year treatment at a later date to get you UK tax resident again. So the termination payments, though, they really are difficult to plan for. Um, you can rely on that double taxation agreement to get some protection, but I, I think the safest, safest plan is to remain non-UK tax resident for the whole year and then plan on becoming UK tax resident from the, perhaps the following 6th of April in the year that your contract overseas is terminated. Uh, a mention on share schemes and long-term incentive plans, uh, they do have UK tax implications. Perhaps easiest illustrated with an example, so you might have a long-term incentive plan, a share award. So you are granted this award, uh, perhaps to best in three years time when you're going to receive some shares. So perhaps you become UK tax resident after two years between that grant to vest period. So you've got two years of non-residence, one year of residence. In that circumstance where you have one third of the time between grant and vest as UK resident, one third of the value of the shares that you receive at the end would be subject to UK income tax and national insurance contributions. So it may be the case that you want to try and time the return to the UK to perhaps become UK tax resident after a significant share vest, or perhaps even speak to your employer and see if it's possible to accelerate share vesting for you. The other point that goes with uh, long-term incentive plans and, and shares received from your employment particularly is that it's very, very important that such shares are sold before you become UK tax resident. Uh, those shares particularly that you receive from an overseas employer, when it comes to UK capital gains tax, uh, there is a significant liability that attaches to them. A brief mention on bonuses, you might receive a cash bonus. So a simple cash bonus. Again, probably easiest to illustrate with an example. So we look at the 2020 calendar year, and perhaps you're entitled to a bonus based on your performance in the 2020 year. So that bonus could be paid to you, say, in August 2021, and you could be UK tax resident at that point. But if you were non-UK tax resident for the 2020 calendar year and didn't do any duties in the UK, that cash bonus would not be subject to UK tax, even if it's paid to you after you've become UK tax resident. So we look at employment income, we look through all the various bits and pieces that make up your remuneration package, and we plan accordingly with you to make sure that you have uh, at least done everything you can to minimize the UK tax impact of when you become UK tax resident. So employment income, then we move on to investments. Some really, really simple advice. But first thing I'll say is this is advice for somebody who is not caught for those really tricky temporary non-residence rules. So this is somebody who's a long-term non-resident. So the simple advice is if you have investments standing in again, sell those investments before you become UK tax resident. Assets, investments standing at a loss, you keep those. If you realize the loss now as a non resident by selling the investment, there is no UK tax relief for that. But if you keep that investment that's standing at a loss and only sell it or dispose of it after you've become UK tax resident, then what happens then is that loss is available for you to offset against future capital gains. Final point on this slide, 
should you cash in your overseas pension scheme? And that's really, really tricky. There are different rules around this. You might have a Hong Kong mandatory provident fund. You might have a, a Singapore CPF fund or a Singapore SRS fund. You might have some other offshore pension scheme. What you need to do with those pension schemes is seek some professional advice and see if there are actions that you can take as a non-UK tax resident that are going to save you tax after you've returned to the UK. So it could be the case that the completely cashing out of an offshore pension scheme, if that's the right thing to do, might be the best advice on the UK tax front. But that really does depend on the pension scheme. So it's quite an individual conversation to have. I think the one thing not to do is don't take any advice at all, because it's very disappointing after you've settled in the UK and um, you look back and you think, oh, I've got this offshore pension scheme and I've missed the opportunity to actually perhaps take something out of that scheme without paying UK tax. Okay. So you think about your investments, you think about the investments that you have as a non-UK tax resident, and you think about actions that you can take to make sure that you've minimised the tax on those investments before you become UK tax resident. And the other side of the coin to that is what you also need to consider is what does a tax efficient strategy for life in the UK look like for me? So your tax efficient strategy in the UK is going to be very individual to you. It's going to depend on your income needs, your domicile status, your retirement objectives. On this slide, I've listed here the UK tax allowances that are available to you each year on a use it or lose it basis. As an absolute minimum, what I would suggest with your investment strategy is that you try and ensure your investments are using as many of these tax-free allowances as you possibly can each year. Just to pick up on one of those allowances, you'll see that you have an ISA allowance. Can't do ISAs as non-residents, but as UK residents, you can do ISAs. So for a couple, that could be £40,000 a year that you can save into ISAs. And once you've actually invested in ISAs, the income earned is free of income tax and the gains that you make are free of capital gains tax. So over a few years, you can have a significant amount of your investment in ISAs protected from income tax and protected from capital gains tax. So we would strongly suggest on the tax front, at least, that you do look at using your ISAs each year after you've become UK tax resident. So Briefly, um, UK land and property, there are particular rules for UK land and property. When you dispose of a UK property as a non-resident, provided you've been non-resident for at least five years, it's only the gain arising after 5th of April 2015 that is charged to UK capital gains tax. If you dispose of UK property after you've returned to the UK, the gain arising over the life of the asset is within the charge to UK capital gains tax. So there could be an advantage for disposing of UK residential property while you remain non-UK tax resident. Um, capital gains tax rates on property, 18%, 28%. Do remember that you've got a 30-day reporting window if you do dispose of UK land or property, you have to tell HM Revenue within 30 days, you have to pay any tax due within 30 days as well. A further tweak or complication to this is if you've ever lived in the property as your main or only home, and it could be your, your perhaps what we call your principal private residence, if it qualifies for relief for that. So if you do have a property that you used to live in, as your main home, and it qualifies as, a, as what we call your principal private residence, then it's not an easy choice as to whether you sell as a non-resident to enjoy the 5th of April 2015 valuation when calculating the gain, or do you actually go back and live in that property once again 
to maximise the main residence relief from capital gains tax that might be then available. So when you're looking at a property that used to be your home, you need to speak to a specialist advisor to understand what the options are, what's going to give you the best outcome, whether you sell as a non-resident or whether you go back and live in it as a home once again. Consider inheritance tax. Now, why am I saying this as a pre-return action? We've mentioned inheritance tax is, is a hideous charge, 40% on everything above 325,000 pounds. That's not an unlikely scenario. Now, what I would say to you, that there's a couple of things that you'd pick up on for somebody returning to the UK, because while you're non-UK tax resident, it may be the case that you're able to pass on assets to the next generation, for example, without actually any UK capital gains tax being payable. And one of the really simple plans, and I like simple, to plan for inheritance tax is to reduce your exposure by gifting assets during your lifetime. It has to be a genuine gift, no strings attached, you don't retain any benefit in what's been gifted, but you survive seven years and it's outside of your estate. £500,000 gift, you're going to save £200,000 in inheritance tax. Really simple planning. But while you're non-resident, so for example, perhaps you're, you're gifting shares or, or you're selling shares to make a, a gift, it could be the case you can do that without paying capital gains tax. But after you've returned to the UK, you will very likely have a tax cost for making those kinds of gifts. And very briefly, the other thing to say is for a non-UK domicile, I mentioned the shelf life for that non-UK domicile status. So for a non-UK domicile, if they've never lived in the UK before, their non-UK domicile status is likely beyond challenge by HM revenue. So actions taken while they remain non-UK tax resident uh, on the basis of saving inheritance tax, perhaps, with their assets, those kinds of actions are then pretty much beyond challenge by HM revenue. If that's left until after the non-UK domicile has been resident in the UK for a few years, perhaps you are leaving that door ajar for HM revenue to begin to challenge the premise that their non-UK domicile status prevails. So one thing you need to do is tell HM Revenue that you've returned. There is no form to complete when you arrive in the UK, but if your address has changed, then you do need to tell HM Revenue that. Uh, you don't want to miss any vital communication that they may send to you. So the way that you actually tell HM Revenue that you've returned is on your self-assessment tax return. And it's on that tax return that you claim your split year treatment as well. So we're in the 21-22 tax year and the filing deadline for this tax return for this year is 31st of January 2023. Oh, well done for bearing with me this far. We're, we're getting towards the end. We are actually beginning to think about wrapping up. Um, so we're almost there. So my key takeaways for today. I think the key to this is to understand the date that you're going to become UK tax resident and potentially fully within the UK tax net and what actions you need to take before that date. Now is the time to think about reducing your exposure to inheritance tax. And, and please don't forget that we've only talked through the UK tax position. Please do have regard to any implications and reporting requirements you may have in, in the country you are leaving or indeed any other relevant jurisdiction. It's really important that you don't take any action on the basis of this presentation alone without actually seeking that professional advice. Okay, 
we're going to move on and have a look at some of these great questions you've been asking me as we've been through the presentation. So let's have a look and, and see um, where we start with this. Okay. Um, so oh, great question to start. When I work out my resident status, can I discount days spent in the UK when I am stuck because of COVID? Oh, goodness me, this is a conversation I've had um, innumerable times over the last sort of 18 months. So you may have a limit. So, for example, you're in full time work abroad. You meet all of the conditions for that. You have a limit for visiting the UK and attached here and maintaining that non-resident status. You're looking at 90, 90 midnights with up to 30 UK work days. Now, what HM Revenue have said is that because of COVID, they will treat COVID as an exceptional circumstance. For example, if your employer asks you to return to the UK um, or because you get stuck or trapped in the UK. Now, the maximum number of midnights you can add to your day count is 60. There is no movement on that. So it's an absolute limit. And it's not an entitlement. You genuinely have to be stuck in the UK to be able to benefit from an extra allowance of up to 60 midnights. I think a, a really important point about this is that if you're in full time work abroad, you have a limit of 90 midnights that you can spend in the UK, but you can only have 30 UK work days. And this extra allowance for being stuck in the UK does not change the number of work days that you can spend in the UK and still meet that, provi um, that uh, provision to be in full time work abroad. That's all very complicated, sounds very complicated, doesn't it? So I, I think the bottom line is that there is an extra allowance when you're genuinely stuck in the UK. It is an absolute maximum of 60 midnights but you do need to be genuinely stuck and you have to leave the UK as soon as you're able to. Need a conversation around that one, I think. Okay. If I return to the UK after more than 30 years away and continue to work for my EU-based company online, how can I avoid paying tax in both countries? It's a great question to ask, actually. Uh, and, and of course, with remote working, this is a scenario that we're seeing more and more. So hopefully the country where you've been working has an effective double taxation agreement with the UK. And what that double taxation agreement allows is that, for example, if you're working in the UK and you're UK domiciled, even though you're working for an overseas employer, all of those earnings are subject to UK tax. But if you've paid tax in another country that does have a double taxation agreement, you can take credit for the overseas tax paid against the corresponding UK tax liability. That is of some help. But of course, if you're in Hong Kong or Singapore, or uh, you, you could be looking at tax rates of 10, 12, 15 percent, as opposed to the UK tax liabilities of perhaps 40, 45 percent. So it is of some help, but it doesn't protect you from those very high rates of tax in the UK. OK, um, next question. I'm not sure I quite understand that one, so we'll skip on a little bit. Um, should we bed and breakfast any shares showing a capital gain just before returning to the UK? Any advice on this would be great. There is plenty of advice to give on this one. Uh, I'll try and keep it brief. OK, so we're assuming that you're not caught for the temporary non-residence rules. And yes, what you should do before you become UK tax resident is sell anything, any of those shares that are standing for the gain do have regard to tax implications in the country where you're doing that, for example. But from a UK perspective, sell everything standing at a gain. Now, what I would say, what you need to consider carefully is that having sold everything at a gain, do you want to then go ahead and, and invest in the same assets again? 
going through this exercise where you look to take out the gains on your investments is also a great opportunity to think, to think about, well, I didn't need to think about you know, tax efficiency as a, as a resident of Dubai. I do need to think about tax efficiency as a resident of the UK. So can I invest in something that's going to give me the, the least tax deduction when I'm resident in the UK? Um, I, I think for safety, you would likely do this at the end of the tax year before your return to the UK, just in case you can't make one of these complex split year treatment cases work for you. So you might do this perhaps in late March in the tax year before you return to the UK. Uh, quick mention on what we call bed and breakfasting. So if you're non-resident, you're not caught for the temporary non-residence rules and all of your investments were purchased after 22nd of March 2006, what that means for you is that you can sell your shares, for example, and if you purchase them more than 24 hours later, you have effectively given yourself an uplift on that cost. But as a non-resident, and not caught for temporary non-residence rules, all assets bought after 22nd of March 2006, as a non-resident, you don't need to be out of the market for 30, 31 days. You only have to be out of the market for, for just more than 24 hours for that. There, there are some great strategies actually to help you with that too. Okay. Um, I've answered that one, I think, on the... Uh, days stuck in the UK. So yeah, this is a good question. In my, just, um, I, I told you the story of Duncan, which is a real story and disappointingly, he didn't speak to me till after the event. So if Duncan was already paying tax until no, in Singapore until November, then was he also required to pay UK tax? So if you remember in Duncan's story, he became UK tax resident in June, 2018. And yes, his Singapore salary from June 2018 until November 2018 was fully charged to UK tax. He could take credit for the tax paid in Singapore on that same income. But of course, Singapore tax rates, I think for him was around about 20%. The UK tax rate was 45%. So it, it really wasn't... Um, yeah, wasn't the, the best conversation I've had in, in explaining some bad news to somebody on that one. OK. Um, OK, next question. Um, if I return to retire with no UK based job after many years overseas, when is the most advantageous time to return? If I sell my overseas property, should I do so before returning to the UK? So quite a few different bits and pieces in there. I think if, it, if it's within your control and you can manage it, I think a great simple and safe plan is to plan on becoming UK tax resident at the beginning of the tax year, perhaps the 6th of April. And that takes away a lot of the complication around split year treatment. Um, if you sell your overseas property, should you do so before returning to the UK? Firstly, do have regard to any tax implications in, in the country where you sell that property. But from a UK tax perspective, um, yes, safe to sell it while you remain non-UK tax resident. Um, you, you've been overseas for more than five years, so not a problem with that. What I would say is that there is relief in the UK for the sale of your principal private residence, provided the conditions for that are actually met. And for a property that, that is your principal private residence, if you sell within the last, um, you sell within nine months of last occupying as your main or only residence, if you've lived in it throughout, then you could be completely free of UK capital gains tax. To turn that into real life, what that could mean is you've got your family home, you struggle to sell it, you come back to the UK, but as long as you sell within nine months of last occupying as your home, you could possibly be free of UK capital gains tax on that sale. OK, I'll try and pick up on one or two bits and pieces um, around uh, that we haven't really looked at yet. Um, 
Okay. Okay, so I'm going to pick up on one that's really quite specific for Singapore, because I know we have many, many of you um, in Singapore who've joined the webinar today. Is CPF money from Singapore taxable in the UK? This is always really, really tricky, actually. If you're not UK domiciled, but UK tax resident, you may have the opportunity to exclude CPF money from being taxed in the UK. Uh, if you can keep it outside of the UK and, and use it outside of the UK and meet all of the conditions for this special remittance basis of taxation to work. But as a general principle, perhaps your UK domicile. If you're able to take that CPF money while you remain non-UK tax resident, then you're not going to be charged to UK tax if you take it as a whole lump sum. That's tricky because you need to give up. I, I, I believe I'm not a Singapore advisor, but I believe you have to give up your PR status. Once you give up your PR status, you have maybe 30 days to leave Singapore. But well, the CPF doesn't pay out until perhaps six or eight weeks after you apply for it, which you can only do after you've given up your PR status. So you're in a real catch 22. So some careful planning is needed for that. Because if, a, if you're UK resident and UK domiciled and you take the whole lump sum, there is a charge to income tax on investment growth from 6th of April 2017. If you're UK tax resident and you take a regular income in the UK from your CPF, that regular income is charged to income tax, as would any other pension income be. So there is a discussion around that CPF fund that needs to be had. Should you take action before you become UK tax resident? And will you be able to manage perhaps to remain non-resident long enough to receive that money free of UK tax? Okay, I think we've got time for another question. Um, let's have a look. We've got some really, really long questions. Um, yeah. All right. Um, I'm a long term non UK resident. My child will attend boarding school in the UK. Will I be liable for UK tax due to my child being in the UK? Will I also be liable due to payment of school fees from funds originating overseas? So I think that the second part of that is probably the easiest one to answer. Will I also be liable due to payment of school fees from funds originating overseas? Um, if you're UK domiciled, no issue with that at all. You can transfer funds to and from the UK at any time with no immediate UK tax implication for that. If you're not UK domiciled, but you're not caught for the temporary non-residence rules, again, there is no issue with you transferring funds to the UK to meet those school fees. Now, the child being in the boarding school in the UK, um, that can be what we call a family tie for you if your UK tax resident status is determined under the complex sufficient ties test. There are ways around that and definitely need to have a discussion around how much time you can spend in the UK and still maintain that really helpful non-UK tax resident status. So apologies, we've answered a few of your questions for you. I'm sorry if we didn't get to your particular question. Uh, please do follow up with an email if um, you would like to ask a question or even ask for a copy of the slides. OK. So just a brief introduction to the Fry Group. I, I know that many of you are familiar with the Fry Group, but the, for those of you who are not so familiar with us, just a brief introduction. We were established more than 120 years ago. Um, since then, we've helped thousands of people around the world and across generations. Today, you'll see on the map, we have eight offices around the world. So we, we do offer a, a global perspective. Our services cover three core areas of financial planning, tax, which is of course where I sit, estates and investments. Our teams work across those three areas and across countries to create the right balance for each client. And our core purpose is to provide financial freedom for our clients. Now, financial freedom means many different things to many different people, 
So we take time to find out what is important to you so we can structure your finances around your goals. So a very big thank you for attending the webinar today. That's very much appreciated. Really enjoyed your questions and your interaction as well. So thank you very much for that. And what I'm gonna leave you with is the slides with our contact details on if you do want to get in touch with me. Thank you.